Welcome back. Um, I haven't had that many people approach me, so I hope after this, when we have the drinks, um, everyone will it will help uh, loosen up the whole situation because we'd really love to hear some feedback or additional questions. Um, not just myself, but all of the speakers who have so generously given some of their time. So um, I'm really pleased to introduce. Vicky for the last and final installment of our conference this year. She's going to be moderating the conversation on drawing and communication. Um, it's a pleasure to have Vicky here. We've been trying to do some projects together. And um, Vicky is an architectural writer and curator. She's an honorary fellow of Reba, previously director of architecture, design, and fashion at the British Council. Good afternoon, everyone. Really nice to be here. And I think this event is, is really exciting and inspiring because it's, it's very unusual you, where you go to an event and there's a kind of open question being asked, really, you know, where there, where there aren't kind of prescribed answers um, and where there's a genuine kind of mix of different disciplines and, and different approaches to, to the subject. And um, so I, I feel particularly excited to be talking about drawing because I think drawing is one of those practices that is inherently open-ended, uh, where the outcome is, can't really be predicted, uh, and where you have to find the answer or the outcome through, through actually doing something. And um, so drawing is um, always a, a very kind of vital subject. It's, 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 it's inherently full of life and ideas um, and action. Um, but of course it can be defined in so many different ways and drawing takes so many forms and in, in recent years it's become a, a hugely expanded field of practice. I think we used to know what drawing was and now I think it's, it's quite difficult to, to, to make a definition of it. Um, I used to be trustee of a charity called the Campaign for Drawing uh, which runs something called the Big Draw every year and its aim is to get everybody drawing. And they define drawing as marks with meaning, which was a fairly broad definition. But I think the speakers that we have today are probably going to push us even further and, um, and, and, and question, uh, what the, question the sort of the purpose and the, um, the function of drawing uh, even, even more in relation to their different interests and areas of practice. Um, drawing and communication specifically is, is, a, is an interesting sort of coupling and I, I think for me drawing is generally a very personal and intimate kind of act. It's, it's the sort of the beginning of an idea, it's, the, um, it's actually the, the, the process by which you know, a thought or an observation of the world um, or, or, or perhaps just a feeling, um, it's where ideas start and they, and they kind of come from the, the, the ultimate private sphere of, of your mind um, out into, into the world. And, um, and I think that, that sort of, the, the kind of the, that sense of the beginnings of something is often what makes a drawing such an effective tool in terms of communicating an idea. Um, and it's often the, the first simple sketch that becomes the, uh, the ultimate way of communicating a project. So this question of communication is, uh, is, is also really interesting in relation to some of the discussions earlier on today about the time scale of, of, of a work and thinking about audiences that might be uh, 100 years in the future. Because often when, when you're drawing, you, 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 you're really expressing your own ideas rather than necessarily thinking about who's going to be looking at this, this drawing. It's a bit like writing a diary. You know, I mean, hopefully mo most people write a diary without having their audience already in mind, although I think blogging perhaps has changed all that. But anyway, um, there's loads for us to talk about, and um, I'm not quite sure which way the discussion's gonna go, because we've got three really interesting speakers, and they're gonna speak about their work and their practice, and also try and address perhaps some more general questions about, about drawing, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. So I'm gonna just briefly introduce the, the, um, our speakers. So Kate Davis is an artist and architect, and um, she, she wears several different hats. She's, uh, she lectures at the Architectural Association, where she's head of the AA Media Program and director of the Unknown Fields Research Lab. Uh, but she also uh, has an art practice called Liquid Factory and a field robotics group called Raven. 
and her work is multidisciplinary, multimedia, and she's interested in the hidden global stories of people and landscapes. So um, really fascinating work, uh, questioning both the tools and the, the, the subject matter of, of the built environment. Uh, then we have Yara Sharif, who's a practicing architect and academic with an interest in design as a means to facilitate and empower forgotten communities. Um, Zara co-founded the Palestine Regeneration Team, a short, a short, uh, the shortening's part, which is a design-led research group that aims to, through speculative and live projects, to search for creative uh, spatial possibilities in, in Palestine. So Yara is primarily interested in the relationship between architecture, spatial design, and, and politics. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see how drawing plays a role within, within all of that. And then thirdly, um, Hugo <coughs> Joe, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, who's just flown in from um, Chicago. Uh, she's Chinese-born, Chicago-based artist who makes videos and installations that explore the urban environment. Um, and she has a master's in fine arts from the School of Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, and a master's in computer engineering from Syracuse. And she exhibits her work nationally, internationally, and um, I'm very interested in uh, a large installation that, that she's, she's made in Chicago, which is called the 150 Media Stream. Hopefully we'll, we'll hear more about that. So we're just gonna, the speakers are just going to come up one after the other. They're going to speak for a maximum of 10 minutes each, and then we'll come up to the panel for discussion. Kate. <coughs> Can you hear me okay? Yep. Take that as a yes. Um, let me put my time on, Vicky, because I waffle. Um, so, I mean, today I, I, I loosely might title the talk, if I would title it, Necessary Transgressions. Um, I'll get on to why, maybe in a minute. Um, normally when I present unknown fields, we present it as a kind of fairly bombastic set of films with loud soundtracks and kind of talking over them in a kind of poetic way. And today I'm going to do a slightly different talk and, and go under the hood a little bit, um, just for the purposes of, of, of the topic today. Um, I suppose I'm interested in drawing, um, as Vicky said, I run Liquid Factory, which is a kind of more of an art practice, and Unknown Fields, which is um, a kind of travelling design studio. Um, and also teach media studies. So that's teaching students, that's looking to architecture students to try and help them understand and navigate the explosion of tools that they have available to them, which I think is also relevant today. Um, and I think about drawing, it's, it's definitely in terms of a verb, um, in terms of things like you know, drawing up from a well or drawing out to draw out a thread like pulling things out from somewhere, uh, drawing things together, um, and maybe even drawing things forth, or some kind of, maybe drawing as in drawing your sword. Um, so my preoccupation, my practices is with landscape and sight. Um, and I want to talk about sight today in relationship to drawing, um, and touch on the expanded territories of the drawing, perhaps the wilder, wilder sites. Um, and what I mean by that is a kind of antithesis of the little plot of land on the OS map that uh, you might look at as an architect, and, and that's, that's it, that's the site. Um, so not as static parcels of territory, but as a tapestry of interwoven dynamics. Um, these are just a quick snaps of my sketchbooks, um, which I don't normally bring out. Um, my drawing practice, personally, is very notational. I'm using drawing to try and understand complexity, usually. Um, seeing drawing as a kind of text, especially in relationship to field notes. Um, a lot of my work, as you'll see, is about travelling. Um, and I'm very uh, drawn by the, uh, the field notes of anthropologists and biologists as a way of, of working through ideas of journals. Um, and as I said, I'm more interested in, in it as a verb, as a practice, rather than as object. Um, and as a way of understanding, not as a mode of representing form, but understanding context and a tool of thought. Um, 
And the hand is fast, so I like to sketch by hand. Um, and the act of drawing, I think, suspends time. Time not just to look at something, but time to spend with something. Um, and a territory for rehearsing and exploring and searching and, and feeling your way. And I'm interested, something that really interests me is the distance between the subject, the site, and the studio. And the studio, the drawings being a kind of abstraction of that site. And the gap between them is something that I think is filled by the notebook, which I see as this kind of really beautiful vessel for taking things back and forth. Um, so I wanted to start with this image, which um, um, the first image I showed, which is also on the postcard, is from a project called The Glass Notebooks. And that came from this um, set of drawings that we did on the window of the bus on a trip through the US um, to visit all the military sites. And I was interested in this idea of drawing into the landscape itself and a, a drawing being a kind of screen. Um, and so the idea, you know, a way of understanding that the site and the drawing should and could exist together in the same space. Um, and I was interested in that as a sighted drawing, um, as, like I say, akin to a, a screen onto the landscape. Um, this is an image that um, I'm really interested in, which is a, an image of a 3D LiDAR scan of a, in the sea. Um, what I like about it is that it reveals the mechanisms of the scanner, which takes uh, images by laser um, in a circle, um, and then the waves of the sea coming in. So what you get is a kind of ECG of the sea, of the, of the waves coming into the beach. It's not an image, it's, you couldn't take a photograph of that, um, but it's revealing dynamics of a site, um, the site not as a static object, that's the brave student in the sea in San Francisco taking the picture, taking the scan. Um, and so this idea of dynamics brings me on to this notion of necessary transgressions of the drawing into more dynamic territory. Um, and that the world is more, ever more complex, ever more mappable. Um, and that actually there's a role to communicate this expanded context, the expanded context within which we design, um, and this extended site. Um, and distant places are conjured in an instant now. They're no longer folkloric or anecdotal, but measured, mapped, and logged. Um, and by the day, the world is more knowable. Our models are very dexterous, and they're, they're, they're you know, moving towards real-time maps of the world. So I think that kind of redesigning or redefining the site for designers as one within a continuum of flows and dynamics that are not always physical, but sometimes socio-political, um, is something that's actually um, really needed. Um, and to unfold the things, we need dynamic, we need other types of drawings that unfold the things we can't see and we can't conceive of, either because they're too big or they're too small um, or they're too fast or they're too slow. Um, which brings me to, to Unknown Fields, which is the practice I run with Liam Young. Um, we take these expeditions around the world, looking at the landscapes, um, which are the shadows cast by the contemporary city. Um, and it, you know, we look at the way that even the most mundane of material things sets in motion a vast planetary scale infrastructure. Um, and there are sites like these, the dis dislocated landscapes across the globe, created and affected by the powerful push and pull of the world's desires. Um, but these physical places are indexes of bigger systems in, the, that are in themselves points of departure, um, a kind of iceberg tip, iceberg tip, tip, tip of deep and complex arrays of sites, um, so from which slip from material to immaterial, so from mega mine to mineral model, <coughs> from cargo ship to container stacking algorithm, from a can to a GPS coordinate. Um, these are, these are fields that necessitate a different kind of field work, I guess. Um, so I'm just gonna, in the little bit of time I've got left, I'm just gonna cherry pick a, a few little bits of work from our, from our unknown fields work that might kind of um, suggest territories for the drawing or, or um, ideas of an expanded um, realm. Um, so we like to look at the circuit board as a, as a territorial map um, at, at the 
um, ex ex expanded drawing of an iPhone um, as a drawing of the world. Um, taking things like the shipping tracking um, that you saw before. Uh, into our work um, to kind of extend the technical drawing to extend the technical drawing of an object like a phone or a shipping algorithm into uh, the films we make to try and overlay overlay those two worlds and kind of it's not supposed to do that but that's fine um, to overlay those two worlds on each other. Yeah, it's not that, it's more that. Imagine it's going really smoothly. <laughs> yeah, that's better. So we were kind of trying to combine the, the work that um, a photojournalist or a documentary, he's not meant to do that, a uh, documentary maker might take, it was kind of per the personal, the emotional, with the impersonal, the, the numbers, the diagrams, the stacking algorithms. Um, this might do a similar thing. Um, and here with this one, this one is in Madagascar. The previous one was in China. Um, and this was a project about the gem fields in Madagascar. So we were looking at a series of value relationships between the bling on a R&B singer's ring and uh, a set of guys working in a conveyor belt um, to dig the gemstones out. Um, and there, the, the diagram, the kind of ergonomics diagram, the efficiency diagram, um, becomes overlaid and, and, and suggests the kind of um, impersonal, um, impersonal uh, nature of the diagram in itself, I guess. Um, these two are from a project in Australia, uh, which look at mining um, over there. And the one on this side is a, a series of mining models that we got from some mining companies um, of underground ore bodies and 3D <coughs> models of underground mines. Um, and it, so it, we, they're, they're put together with some terrestrial LiDAR scans to give you a subterranean journey through uh, the gold mines and the gold ore bodies under the ground in the Australian outback. Um, and those excavations are very much driven by the, uh, the gold price. So the one on the right um, was a live drawing done, recorded now, but done off the off a live stock market um, feed, um, which redraws an excavation depending on the gold price on that day. It's the idea that the gold price is high, you dig more ground out because you can <coughs> sell lower concentrations. Um, so we like the idea that this abstract thing creates a landscape that is actually a drawing of um, the financial stock market in a way. Um, and then this was a, a pattern that we made from the, an audio file of some Indian weavers in Varanasi, hand weavers, the last of their generation, and the, the sound of their hand would loom, um, which we then made, asked, got them to translate into a piece of gold fabric. Um, by hand. So it was a drawing, it was a coded translation, but then it was also an instruction to make a piece of fabric. Um, this is a film called Unraveled, which charts um, this Indian woman walking through the, the factories of the production of fast fashion, so where your jeans come from, wearing this hand-woven um, cloth, which is actually encoded. This has an audio encode, encoded into it. Um, I think that's pretty much it. This is, was the last piece, but um, I'll just talk very briefly. <coughs> this was a piece in Alaska, and we were looking at um, climate change uh, statistics and calculations that are run through massive supercomputers. Um, and the reams and reams and reams of data that's looking at observing a landscape which is changing fundamentally for the people who live there, um, changing faster than anyone else's home territory. And so we made these, which are completely digitally created, um, landscapes built from uh, from running the statistics in as, as kind of um, arbitrary codes to make a form-finding exercise and a texture. So we wanted to create 
a set of kind of uncanny, slightly unfamiliar landscapes um, out of the um, code <coughs> written by the supercomputers. Um, that's it. A uh, little bit over time, sorry. Um, been discussed earlier in the presentation about this issue, the subject of time and memory, but also about maybe drawings and the notion of occupation. And this is particularly relevant to somebody like me who comes from a context which is occupied, like Palestine, and it very much shaped my identity as an architect and the way I represent myself and also think about architecture. So uh, for me, coming up, I mean, I'm calling it coming from what I call an uncertain landscape, but also an invisible uh, landscape. I had to think uh, as an architect for means of representation of that invisible community and uncertain landscape. And this is particularly uh, important because whenever the subject of Palestine, Israel comes, probably the mainstream uh, media images that comes across are more the popular one where you see the separation wall, where you see illegal settlements, where you see probably uh, kind of a, a, a certain images or artifacts of, uh, of that context that do not necessarily only document uh, that context and what happens there. A lot of the time the imagery that comes from that context almost renders Palestinians as absent citizens or even passive citizens in the sense that there is occupation and they react to it. This in itself kind of created a conflict of identity for me myself as an architect and as an individual trying to think how do I represent my own landscape, especially when always the uh, images suggest the biblical also images or narratives that used to represent that landscape almost that it is empty from anybody who's uh, living there. So this kind of mental occupation or occupation through imagination is what I'm interested in. And probably it's what set the base for uh, uh, what I'll, I'll be talking about in the uh, next few minutes. So uh, I'm just here uh, uh, quoting Mark Twain when he visited the landscape or the Holy Land. He wrote briefly, we arrived safely at Tabor Mountain. The entire way we didn't see a living soul hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Uh, it kind of uh, it suggesting that uh, even the trees, uh, the famous olive trees are not there. Kind of the Palestinian landscape with its outstanding natural beauty, olives, the unique man-made terraces. People who actually inhabited and cultivated the landscape have been completely left out or stripped out uh, of that landscape. Uh, this kind of phenomena or occupation through imagination, I'm calling it, was also referred to by a theorist called Edward Said as imaginative geography, where space is being manipulated, where the imagery uh, in, impact human perception uh, of how do you read that space. In our case, it was a very colonial perception where a kind of it was a Western biblical imagination that coincided with a colonial expansion, a place empty in need of dynamism. This obviously was very much accompanied by drawings, and in this case maps, where these maps were always demonstrating an empty landscape. I'm quoting here, there is no such thing as Palestinian people. It's not as if we came and threw them out. They just did not exist. So this idea, this Im imagery, uh, it also was referred to by Edward Said as, uh, it kind of reflects on that danger of drawing and the danger of the map, particularly. He, I, I quote, in the history of colonial invasion, map are always first drawn by victors, since maps are instruments of conquest. Geography is therefore an art of war, but can also be an art of resistance if there is that alternative map or um, alternative geography. 
So it, it, this, it, when it came to Palestine, maps were never drawn by Palestinians. Maps were always drawn by the powerful, the occupier, whether it was uh, the British map, the Ottoman map, and then later the Israeli maps. What happens is that Palestinians were always excluded. Their narrative is always excluded, left <coughs> out, leaving also Palestinians themselves with an absent mental map that we really don't know where our spaces start or end. So this need of an alternative method for representing a need for an alternative narrative became really the driving force of why I decided to think that there is a need for me as an architect to start drawing my own map, start, draw, start also thinking of new methods of drawing my landscape where the Palestinians are no longer absent within that landscape. And this was particularly important because whenever I communicate maps of my context, there were always those old maps, and I started to think, who is going to document the contemporary Palestine? Contemporary Palestine now is er very much about time and immobility. Uh, invisible networks of car and people move around because of this kind of extensive, exhausted boundaries and checkpoints and fragmentation of the map. These invisible communities and network are creating what I call an art of resistance that takes place on the margin. Cities appear, others die, communities move from one space to another, really very ephemeral landscape always in the process of moving. But it's exactly because that lands landscape is very ephemeral. Uh, there was a need for me to kind of come up with a way to represent it, and that's why a two-dimensional map in its conventional sense was not really in my view, sufficient in order to document the landscape. So probably the starting point of me thinking of how do I narrate my landscape, I started thinking of the idea of cutting the land to allow it to breathe. And that concept of cutting also made me realize that I need also to go beyond the surface in order to read the landscape. And this is where a, a concept of what I call surface air and underground started to appear. And when I think about surface air and underground, I think, how, do I, how can I read my landscape? And how can I, as an architect, also think of my design uh, from that perspective? Do I need really to step away from my exhausted surface that is full of border lines? And could this become a way for me to also liberate my mental space because I'm always confined within boundaries? So this idea of reading space, air, and underground it became very fascinating for me because the more I started to read the landscape from air, I started to realize how much my landscape is very invisible. And I started to realize how particularly the rural landscape has been completely left out, kind of backing up again that idea that Edward Said called earlier, which is called imaginative landscape, where uh, the rural is completely absent, always being left out and abandoned to become a passive landscape that later is prepared to be occupied and taken. So this contemporary, what I'm calling contemporary map of absent, whereby the rural has been transformed into a periphery, into a space full of voids, uh, started to kind of inform the drawings that I'm doing, thinking of what uh, how could I mark that landscape? Is there a mean for me to also define and stitch that landscape? And this is, for instance, a map of actually an underground of the rural landscape where the natural resources are being literally taken out. And I'm talking here about uh, water wells and water aquifers that has been taken out. And I'm trying to see if there is a way for me to document and mark uh, these water wells as a way to make a statement. Uh, when I was looking under, so uh, here I kind of uh, starting to move underground when I was thinking about the map. So when I was looking under the surface, beyond the kind of conventional way of looking at the separation wall or the checkpoints, there, there is another whole war of I, what I call war of stone, archaeology, water and sewage that is taking place in Palestine. And to put this uh, slightly in context, uh, there are whole mountains that are being flattened from the culture of stone quarrying that, quarrying that is taking place in order to produce uh, the Jerusalem stone or the Holy Land stone that is now being seen all over the world. The estimate is that in 10 years' time, there are whole mountains and landscape in Palestine that will completely be flattened out with their memories 
and with their time. So this idea of going under the surface became also a way for me to say, maybe drawings should become a way to exaggerate what's going on. When I went above and when I was looking at an airspace, there was kind of another discrete dimension also absent from the political maps and from the Palestinian narrative that really was important to uh, narrate. The airspace that is really cluttered with military airways and surveillance system is also cluttered with birds uh, and bird migration. Ironically, what I found out while I was doing my uh, work and working on my map, I realized that the biggest war that Israeli air forces have ever faced in their life was not actually a war against them, it was a war of birds, of bird migration, where a lot of uh, aeroplanes have been destroyed as a result. And it kind of even this kind of idea of an icon like a bird became kind of a way to occupy the mind. And here I'm uh, referring to uh, the uh, bird which is uh, considered as the most Zionist bird uh, in nature, the hoopoe bird, which became an Israeli national bird. When they were describing it, they said it's a bird that takes good care of its children and uses creative tactics to defend itself. It's not a song bird. When it wants to take over a territory, there is no external difference between male and female. And that's why it's a, a, a Zionist spirit. So for me, kind of like these probably ironic or, uh, I don't know, dark comedy, if I may call it, started to kind of trigger, what do I do as an architect? What if I start to map these roots of bird migration on my landscape and start to see if birds and that map of bird could become a new territory for me to mark that landscape. So uh, to take this further, I mean, what I want, uh, I've got two minutes to wrap up, is that this role of the uh, drawing and this role of particularly also the speculative drawing started to become a mean for me to stretch my space of imagination as much as it became a way for me to stretch my physical space uh, when I read the landscape. So I'm going to, uh, uh, I have one minute left, can I? No, all right. So I, I will leave it there. I'm just going to um, finish with a couple of uh, images at the very end. So I'm just flipping through here. So these are all kind of types of representation of how the landscape started to become a mean to negotiate what's happening in the map. And by a kind of the drawings became also a design language for me. So sometimes they were they became a way of exaggeration, but at other times it became a way of confrontation, where it addresses the other while also capturing, cutting, crushing, and excavating. So um, the last bit I want to end with is a current project we're working on on Gaza, where Gaza is a city that has completely collapsed and has been destroyed. And one of the key issue is how do we draw? a landscape that has been completely erased. Uh, how to draw a city where the fabric is exposed and that relationship between street, neighborhood, <coughs> and room is very blurred. How do you think architecture in that sense? How do you read home? So uh, I will leave it there as uh, the last uh, uh, drawing. Um, and uh, it, it, all I want to say is that Maybe there is a need, therefore, for drawings and for the architects to kind of negotiate between, lying between dream and realism. Uh, the work really, and what you've been seeing, is really about offering moments of small change that at times try to celebrate small details of every day, but also at other times try to see irony, subversion, and also invisibility as means to capture hope, but also capture memory and identity. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, uh, as mentioned. I'm a video artist, originally uh, from China, and uh, currently based in Chicago. So I want to talk uh, about my video work, uh, as it relates to um, Chinese traditional landscape paintings, as well as some other influences. Um, so this is a close-up of a famous uh, Chinese scroll painting uh, entitled Along the River During the Qingming Festival. Um, it is by a 12th century artist. So the painting captures the daily life of people uh, in the capital, uh, and it depicts space and the built environment using uh, several classical conventions. Uh, first, uh, scenes and activities are happening simultaneously, 
uh, and there is a lack of hierarchy in the characters uh, and their actions. Uh, another distinct characteristic is the uh, isometric flat space. Uh, all of these features uh, kind of encourage the viewers to uh, take their time to go from scene to scene uh, in order to fully experience uh, the painting in a slow, meditative rhythm. So these aspects of traditional Chinese paintings um, affect how I understand the representation of space and the built environment. So the, uh, the next two minutes, uh, I'm gonna show you uh, excerpts, video excerpts from a four part uh, series called The Humors. So this piece is called Green Play. Uh, you'll notice that I used uh, similar techniques as the Chinese school paintings um, to emphasize time over space. And I built uh, compressed scenes um, for micro-narratives to happen simultaneously. Uh, and the footage of uh, these videos um, shows various mundane activities in Chicago and New York City uh, but in my compositions, uh, actions and times are reorganized, um, so it creates a surrealistic space. This is a painting by a Yuan Dynasty artist uh, depicting a Chinese historical figure, uh, uh, a, a Taoist priest um, retiring from the uh, material society and relocating to the mountains. Uh, so the scene uh, in this painting is completely imaginary, um, but it is built out, um, built out of recognizable elements. So uh, the twisting trees and the high waterfalls and the steep cliffs uh, kind of shows the mystical nature of the journey and the concept of displacement. Um, and the little figure, um, lower left, um, reflects the Taoist concept of the insignificance of the human presence uh, in the vastness of cosmos. Uh, so the way that this space is shown here kind of foreshadows uh, the physical and psychological uh, sense of the story, uh, which is that the priest is leaving home and embarking on a long journey um, to an unknown place. So this is a, a piece uh, called Two of the Water Flows. Uh, for this piece, I, uh, I documented uh, kind of my everyday encounters from walks in Chicago after I relocated to the city and I uh, composed the documentations into a, a fantastical place. Uh, so it's a personal work that is kind of like a visual diary uh, to me, and I um, invite the viewers to, um, to this dream-like journey uh, where they can contemplate the harmony between the, the nature and the urban spaces. So the water here serves as a, a element to soften the, um, the urban space and establish a rhythm in this kind of complicated and monumental landscape. Uh, and the portrait orientation of the piece uh, mirrors the Chinese uh, mountain landscape. Um, and just like the Chinese paintings with tiny figures, I'm also framed in the small window in the center of the composition, uh, almost invisible. 
Uh, the rhythm is an essential element of time-based art uh, and also my major fascination of the built environment. So in contrast to the previous work, uh, this video, uh, Meet on Flutter, uh, evokes the rhythm of uh, hide and seek uh, as pedestrian uh, kind of move horizontally across the vertical patterns of the building. Uh, while I created a lyrical rhythm in the previous work, in this piece, I kind of experimented with uh, a kind of syncopated rhythm of people moving through uh, the verticality, uh, almost as if the people were the musical notes and the buildings were the scores. Uh, so there is also an installation component to my work. Um, I'm inspired by the modernist reliefs and the way sculpture collapses into space and into the environment, uh, kind of merging painting and sculpture. So as part of my video installations, I use uh, this relief concept to kind of, uh, yeah, it's not supposed to like this, just ignore the, Shakiness. So I use the kind of the relief concept to build panels uh, on the wall, and I project the video onto the, the panels to kind of evoke uh, architectural sensibility, uh, and also create an illusion of like uncanniness. So the viewer uh, first perceives the installation as a, as a flat image, but as they walk closer to the to the piece, um, they kind of see this three dimensional quality. Uh, almost as if it is a moving sculpture. Uh, so at, at last, I want to talk about the idea of uh, Buddhist mandala. Um, mandala is kind of found in Indian, Tibet, as well as China. Uh, it is a map for spiritual inspiration. Uh, in traditional uh, mandalas, the square represents the earth, and the circle represents the sky, and there is a strong spiral movement towards, towards the center of the core, uh, which symbolizes a journey um, towards the inner unity and the reconciliation. <coughs> so I want to apply this to the urban landscape, uh, particularly in an in-between place. So I found this this kind of in-between place uh, in the subway network uh, in New York City. Uh, which the place has like a strong sense of theatricality and also a collective urban rhythm uh, and spiritual energy. Uh, so as you can see, the urban commuters uh, are in this really compressed environment, sharing a ritualistic moments and seemingly sharing a direction. So uh, this piece is called Underground Circuit and it, it has this mandala structure that represents the universe inside the built environment uh, and moving in uh, kind of one direction without an end uh, and the people never quite arriving to their destination. So the subway kind of becomes a symbol uh, for the repetitive cycle of life and also this concept of connected destinies. Uh, so my... Uh, ultimate uh, quest in using video as a medium is to capture this uh, seemingly random everyday moments of people's activities in constructed spaces through uh, the process of collaging and reassembling. Uh, so I see kind of my time-based work as an extension of painting and drawing uh, in capturing the rhythm of life in built environment which is essential uh, in defining a sense of place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. That was really fascinating. And um, there was su such interesting connections between your, your work. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, just thinking about some, some of the themes that, that I, be I began to outline at the beginning, I think, um, it's really, it's really brought to life a lot of the, the, the sort of issues I was thinking about. Um, Hugo, if I could start with you. Sure. 
um, that was that was fascinating to see this kind of how film became uh, an extension of, of drawing and painting. Yes. And I was thinking about how um, one of, one of the things you said about traditional the conventions of Chinese landscape right. drawing painting was that there's a sort of distortion of the reality in order to get to some kind of a, a truth, you know. And, and um, I mean that's also true of some Western. Um, conventions of drawing in terms of perspective, I guess. Right. Um, but do you feel that that's also the case with your video practice? That you you're kind of by distorting reality, you're almost getting to present some, you know, a, a deeper truth or a, or a clearer sense of reality. Right. Um, so I think, first of all, I think my video uh, how it relates to painting and drawing is that, like I mentioned to you, I feel like my raw footage is almost like. The paint, you know, and the the, the editing software I'm using, uh, you know, is kind of like the uh, the tool, the brush. Uh, so uh, for me, uh, the process uh, is the you know the the kind of the journey I took to collect the raw footage, but also uh, go back to my studio and uh, reassemble and collaging those footage into its composition. And and yes, I think by um, making a uh, subtly distorted perspective and uh, this uncanny, um, uncanny composition that I'm hoping to discover a sense of place and the rhythm that is uh, kind of embedded in uh, each urban uh, landscapes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I feel like there is definitely a truth uh, of spiritual energy in what <coughs> I'm you know, seeking. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting comparing your approach as an artist to that of you know, the conventions of architecture and urban planning, where we where we are much more preoccupied by representing seemingly that you know the real. I just wondered from your perspectives as as architects, you know how what you what you made of Yuga's approach and whether whether some of these tactics can be. Um, useful in, in trying to capture things often you know Kate your, your work on, on a sort of scale that we're not used to thinking about um, and it often seems unmanageable really to think on that kind of scale um, how, how did how did you feel about this sort of willful distortion of reality I, th I mean I think it's um, actually necessary I think it's really necessary that it's a thing of you're trying to connect with how people feel about things, not necessarily the reality of what they see. If, I sh if you showed someone a picture of the subway, it'd be like a picture of the subway. If you show them how the subway feels, then there's a truth. That's a truth, but you're getting to it through a kind of exaggeration or whatever. I mean, that's how I see it. Um, so to try and fight, to try and I mean, it's Herzog's ecstatic truth, right? The, the kind of um, subverting truth in order to find a deeper. Um, resonance, I think, is is really critical. Mm -hmm. And actually, architectural drawings lie all the time; they habitually lie, um, <laughs> just for other kinds of means, you know. Um, Yara, well, um, I, I thought your the, the issue of agency came across very strongly um, to me in your mm -hmm. your work that drawing as a form of you know reclaiming mm -hmm. uh, a landscape. And um, I, I I thought, well, that's. Uh, you know, it, it, it's really great to see drawing as that sort of willful imposition. It's it's not just a response to what exists. It's a way of changing things. Can you say a bit more about how, sure. the, yeah, the actual role that the drawing process plays in yeah. in that thought? Sure. I mean, also probably the question relates a bit more also to the early question mm -hmm. about whether the drawings there is a kind of a bit of an exaggeration that takes place or going beyond just the mere documentation of a certain fact, but. Uh, definitely with the, there are also certain sometimes types of drawings and methods of representation that are not necessarily there just to document but probably also to shake up reality a bit mm -hmm. and use exaggeration or irony or uh, surrealism as a way to uh, suggest also future scenarios that might happen or could have happened and that's definitely something that I've been trying to do where drawings are for me, also a medium to shake up the reality, but also suggest future mental mm -hmm. imagination and mental occupation that's mm -hmm. that's taking mm -hmm. place. And how do you find, I'm um, coming to the question of communication, um, what kind of response do you get to, to this kind of work? And how is it actually, how do you use it, I guess? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Um, it, it's quite interesting because a lot of time I get asked who are your audiences. I mean, is, is this type of uh, drawing or communication meant, say, for the Palestinian people themselves who are living under the occupation, or is this for the other? Uh, and I, I always say that it actually is meant for both. I mean, surely when I started doing these drawings, it was more a kind of a design based research where I was trying to find my own identity. But later I realized that there is a role for me to document the current in order for the future to, in order to mark something for the future generations. So we're not always negotiating maps drawn by somebody else, but at least it's kind of a personal voice that can contribute to the collective. That's definitely my main aim of it. But it also represents itself on life projects. Like for instance, when I started drawing the drawings of the birds, it translated itself on identifying key sites on the landscape where there are bases for bird migration and they became my priority site to do construction work yeah. in, for instance. So it's really a tool for understanding um, the, the landscape yeah. in a practical way, yeah. yeah. And I mean, Kate, you some of the, the drawings you talked about and the techniques um, have have a similar um, have a similar outcome in the sense that they help us to understand real life processes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the 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 example of the the diagram or the drawing that you, you showed that was being produced of um, got for gold mining. Mm -hmm. Example. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as something that is sort of artwork or do you see it as a practical tool for for understanding the world you know that's interesting because uh, i think we oscillate between decide you know how we talk about ourselves whether it's artists or filmmakers or it's a kind of ongoing discussion between Liam and i but um i think what one of the things we're really interested in is actually we we we've heard these stories before, right? We know this. We know that um, sweatshops exist, and we know that there are mines, and we know that there's pollution. And, but I think we're interested in how that communication is done, um, and um, how we become, and why we be, become numb to it. And so, I guess we're quite interested in the modes, the ways <coughs> ways that information is transmitted. So, for instance, in the Madagascar project, we were interested in the two types of ways that that context was mainly described and one was through diagrams and graphs so it'll be like 50 percent of the rainforest of madagascar has been destroyed in the last you know for however many years or a pie chart you know or a statistic it's very dry mm -hmm. and then on the other end of that you have a kind of uh, anthropological film project which is very emotional which goes out and does a kind of a completely different take on it so we're interested if you pull those two things together and you and and you kind of work with the visual languages of different mm -hmm. things. So the, the headline of a mm -hmm. newspaper is one very oversimplified language. What that means to kind of invite complexity in the story, not, not simplify, but invite absurdity, mm -hmm. and then come to the middle of the, the film and say, and, and kind of try and turn it on its head a little bit. I guess that's, so the language is important, the visual language is important because it taps into a thing that we know and we've mm -hmm. seen. Um, I guess. Mm. There's a lot to explore here and we really can't do it justice because um, we, we have to finish it but I just wondered if anybody wants to ask a, a question or make a, a response to the, the work. Any hands? Was there somebody there? Yeah, it's a guy at the back. Oh yeah, sure. <coughs> The panelists talked about distorting the truth to get to the truth. I'm just wondering why base it on reality at all? Why not make it all up? What, what about that balance between imagination and the basis in reality in people's work? Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to respond? You said that just that. Yeah, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, I think you, you're referring to the fact at the beginning we were talking about Chinese landscape. Um, conventions of distortion. Um, so yeah, the question is sort of why, why, why do we need reality in drawing? Why can't we make it, make it all up? Uh, I think for me, it's kind of um, you know using kind of recognizable element is uh, a way to uh, 
kind of make my viewer to kind of to take my viewer in because that's what they kind of see every day. So that resonate with them. And by kind of uh, just pose or you know uh, putting footage from different location, different time together, I kind of create this meaningful connections and uh, and rhythm and relationships and the stories that um, you know that is not true you know but people when people see it they start to imagine it and there's a connection that comes out of you know this um, what what they normally see the reality that they see but you know but then there is this surrealistic uh, element into it so I, for me it's a better way to communicate with my viewers. I was just gonna say, I mean, I, I get, I, I, I like the question. Of, I suppose I'm not a surrealist, um, <laughs> but even if I was, I think the there's a, there's some truth in that too, right? So some, somewhere in some mode, there's a truth to be to be kind of got at, and whether that's and I think that that's always that's always there. You, there's there has to be some kind of recognition on the part of the the audience, some kind of deeper understanding coming through of something, otherwise it's just a random thing. <laughs> right. you know, I just want to ask a question, is there such a thing as a pure truth? Uh, mm. I mean, that's another thing that one needs to think, and is there such a thing as something being neutral? Because there is always a way to uh, kind of exaggerate certain layers and take others out. So that's, again, probably we always need to think where is the element of truth lying. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe one last point. Yeah. I want to ask um, uh, you, you started, you started at the beginning about um, what is drawing and how its definition has been expanded and we've seen more and more. Uh, it's kind of um, uh, very different uh, kinds of drawings. And I was wondering if you could define what um, is not drawn mm -hmm. or what are its limits. Brilliant. I think that's a really great question to put to all of them as a sort of clo perhaps a closing statement, because I think we have to we have to wrap up uh, in a couple of minutes. But it's a really brilliant question. What is not drawing? Because you 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 sometimes each of you interchangeably use terms like mapping. Uh, or diagrams, and um, so it, it, can, can you can you focus on what you think drawing is not? Maybe maybe let's start to in reverse order. Yara. Sure. Uh, for me, I think there are no limits to drawing. I think it's a very open-ended process, and I believe that uh, we do need that uh, kind of uh, blurry boundary between. A, 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 the different mediums in order to negotiate space to, to kind of trigger ideas. So for me, it's open-ended. It can start with a line and end up with a film, a, or vice versa, or it can start up with a line and end up with an image. A, as long as it triggers a form of imagination, it, it goes open-ended. And that's why a, I feel personally, I'm always kind of having new techniques of a, negotiating what I call drawings. Um. So I kind of second that. Um, I used to think that drawing is more like a visual, you know, representation of of idea. Um, but now, when uh, we move into the contemporary art world, and you know, there are artists who create um, audio audio works. Uh, there are artists uh, who create uh, like John Cage. Uh, well, I mean, he actually create a graphic straw, you know, and to expre express express. Um, indicate the experience of performance. Uh, and uh, there are words, you know, like, for example, Chinese characters that is, you know, a lot of the Chinese characters is actually based on the image of object. So which that is language, you know, but words, even if just words, two words put together can invoke a sense of visual experience. So I, I really, I think for, for me, it's, Pretty much, it's, it's like and like the, you know the unlimited options. Like drawing is, you can find drawing the concept of drawing in pretty much everything that you do. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I think um, 
I, I think it's, it's, it's more useful not to describe it as a thing or an object. I think that's not, I mean, a drawing is something very different. Like you could describe what a drawing is, but drawing as a practice, I think is, depends on the person and it's much more about um, what you're trying to do with it, I think. In a way, like maybe closer to, to music, you know. Um, that this could be a glass and a bottle, but if it's used by a musician, then it's music, or it's, it's an instrument, right? So I think that that's, you know, maybe that's a, it's not a great analogy, but it's it's more the the verb and the act, the idea of of different. I would say different types of drawing aren't about the medium, but are about the way that you're using the medium. So a different type of drawing to me is a drawing that I do for myself, which is much more the drawing up from a well kind of drawing, right? trying to dig and trying to spend time with something using the time that it takes to draw as, a, as the medium. So that time that it takes to spend with something can be done in a video or it can be done um, in any other way. But it's the, the act is, is a tinkering one. It's a kind of, it's a search in a way. And it doesn't necessarily need to have a prescribed medium. And then there are drawings which, you know, the, the act of, of drawing to communicate, to to draw something might be speculative, to find a way into someone else's kind of being and, and touch them. I think that that is a very different type of drawing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, subtly like, and subtly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to add a little, uh, just to follow your uh, what, you, what you said. Uh, I was talking about mandala, and there is a, a, a type of mandala called sand mandala, which is created by Tibetan. Um, Tibetan uh, Buddhist, um, Tibetan monks. So what they did, what they do is this kind of like a ritual. Uh, they uh, they would you know spend days you know to to just build the the really complicated um, design and uh, and after they finish the design, they would literally put destroy it and put every put the colored sand in a jar and release the sand into a river. You know I think just the act you know the act of creating something and letting go of it and the experience of creating it is uh, it itself, you know. You know Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a very beautiful and uh, evocative image to end on. Um, but I, I love this, these, these alternative definitions that, that are coming out of what drawing is, isn't, um, as in, you know, a closed process or a, a fixed object. Um, it's, uh, that, for me, that's, that's really captured something very truthful about drawing. So thank you very, very thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you.